can seem so tall and you realize life's not always fair you can run away and hide and let the old man decide or you can change your circumstances with the prayer teaching us to praise his name no matter what situation we find ourselves in if we're on the mountaintop continue to praise his name if you find yourself in a valley experience you especially want to praise his name our God is a deliverer he's still on the throne no one has thrown him off no one will ever throw him off the throne for God has highly
exalted Jesus, giving him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, things in heaven, things in earth, things underneath the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. This is Minister Pat Holmes with St. So Simon Ministry coming to you live from the secret place. Glory to his name. And once again, decreeing the blessings of the Lord upon you, your household, and everything that pertains to you. I am so anxious to jump into tonight's teaching because it is blessing me. God has been developing this subject matter in my heart for the last uh, 72 hours, and I was driving down the road yesterday, and he gave me part two to this teaching, and it literally almost caused me to just stop in the middle of the road. I was like, oh my God, I never would have taken that teaching that way. You know the word of God is compared to bread, and your spirit man can chew on it 24 hours a day. David said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I want to speak on the subject matter, unsolved case files unsolved case files and that's what I will deal with tonight in regards to situations and circumstances that occur in all of our life and we still have questions concerning it sometimes adverse situations and circumstances where people have done harm to the saints of God well I want to introduce to you right away from the scripture the avenger one of the titles for the Lord is Avenger. Let me give you the definition of what an Avenger is. One who vindicates one's rights. Oh, glory to God. One uh, who does justice. It says to do one justice. I'm sorry. It says also to protect, to defend. I like that. It means to avenge a thing, to punish a person for a thing. And I'm going to talk to you for a few moments in part one of this teaching concerning the role of the avenger. I'm going to take you to Luke 18 in the scripture, the first eight verses. And most most of you will remember this, and uh, this is regarding Jesus in the role as the avenger. Listen to every word of this in these eight scriptures. I will be right back to share with you what he shared with me. Here it is. Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in the city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, Yet because this widow troubleth me, I shall avenge her, lest by continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Oh, hallelujah. You see, we learn from that passage that I just read. We learn that we are to continue coming to the just judge, that he does hear us when we cry out, and he will render a verdict concerning our situations that need a vengeance. But I want to point out right away up front that he's also a God of mercy and a God of grace. And of course, we know that, but we don't hear a lot of teaching on the fact that he is also the avenger of us, his people. Now, I want to share several uh, 
points from my outline here concerning people where Jesus stood in the gap or Father God stood in the gap as their avenger. I want to remind you of Hannah. Hannah had not had a child. She cried out and she cried out wanting to have, uh, bring forth seed. You know, in the Old Testament, the women were looked down upon uh, by society if they did not have a child. And Hannah had not had a child. And you know the story in the book of Samuel, how she went to the house of the Lord and she prayed with everything that was within her. See, like that woman in Luke 18 that we just read, she kept coming. Hannah kept coming, but here she came to the house of the Lord and she was praying everything, emotions, everything involved till there were no words coming out of her mouth. Only her lips were moving. Most of you remember the story. And Eli, the high priest, looked at her and thought she was drunk. But she let him know, oh no, Lord, I am not drunk. They called him Lord, the little, little Lord in the days of old. I am not drunk, or the little L, I should have said, for Lord. I'm not drunk. But my heart is heavy before God. And she was persistent, and we know that the high spirit priest spoke a blessing upon her or a prophetic word upon her letting her know that she would bring forth a child and at the appointed time we know the story Hannah brought forth Samuel a powerful prophet that was used of the Lord but I want you to know Hannah had been tormented by her husband's other wife because in the days of old let me stress that again in the days of old in the old covenant it is not a allowed now, but in the days of old, they were allowed by law to have more than one wife. And this other wife that her husband had married, Penina, would make mockery of Hannah. Often Hannah would be in tears. Again, women were scorned in those days when they had not produced children and Penina was producing plenty of children. She was the second wife that, uh, I think his name was Elkaniah, the husband. She was the second wife that he had married. So she made mockery of Hannah. But Hannah took her, oh my God, she took uh, before the Lord a petition with wailing and with weeping and she laid it at the feet of the Lord. I want you to know we need to follow that example. It doesn't say in the Bible that she went all over the neighborhood talking about Penina. No, she went into the presence of the Lord and she made her petition and her request known to him and God granted her the just judge granted granted her. The avenger granted her her petition. I want to also mention Jehu. We're talking about God as the avenger, the one that brings justice. All of us remember Jehu in the Old Testament. He was the one handpicked by God to bring Jezebel down. Oh, glory to God. Now, I could go a whole new route with that, but I'm going to try to stay on track. But he was chosen by God, if you remember, to bring Jezebel down. And when he rode up to her palace this morning, Jehu was even riding his horse in such a way that the watchman on the wall looking out said, the guy that's coming rides like Jehu. He was a man on a mission. He had been commissioned by God, the avenger, to bring down wicked Jezebel. And you know the story how the eunuchs pushed her out of the window and how the horses trampled up on her and she was brought to her death. Oh my God, we're talking about the avenger. God is an avenger and he knows the situations and circumstances and the mistreatments and the whatever tragedies have come to all of us have presented itself in our lives or presented themselves in our life. He knows everything. Glory to God. There's a book in heaven written regarding each one of us. I want to mention Samuel. We're talking about God the avenger. 
Samuel was the one that had to bring down wicked King Agag, a heathen king. When the Hebrew children were coming through the wilderness and were en route to the promised land, the Amalekites came up to the back of the line, the Bible teaches, and the Jewish people weren't doing anything to anybody. They were simply pressing through under the orders of the Lord, following Moses, en route to the promised land, obeying God. And all of a sudden, when the Amalekites came, they began to attack them, and they killed out many of the women and children at the back of the line. They killed out God's chosen people unprovoked. And God let Moses know, just keep on marching, keep on going. He didn't even give Moses the answer at that time. And then later on he said that there would be war with the Amalekites and God would destroy them. So we take it up here with what I've just quoted you. The Jewish people went and settled in the promised land and then Father God speaks to the first king of Israel. His name was Saul. And he says to Saul, I remember what the Amalekites did to my people. I'm talking about the event that he sees everything that we go through. Old folks used to say he may not come when you want it, but he's always on time. He says, I remember what they did to my people when they were sojourning in the wilderness. He said, I want you to go and declare war, war upon the Amalekite. And he was to kill the king, King Agag. He was to bring destruction to the city. But you know what King Saul did? He went down there and brought back with him the best of the cattle. He did it his way, in other words. And he also brought back King Agag. Now enter Samuel, that same Samuel, that same prophet I mentioned to you a few moments ago that was prayed through into this earth by his mama Hannah because she desired a child that prophet. He goes to King Saul. Did you obey God in the orders that were given you? Oh yes I did Saul said. So Samuel with the prophetic ear he says why is it I hear the bleeding of sheep? I'm hearing the sound of sheep and he uh, began to like what we say crawdad at that time crawfish. Long story short as I said he brought back the sheep and he brought back the king. If you're going to wipe anybody out this your enemy. You want to wipe out the head. But no, King Saul compromises. This would be a trait or a trend in his servitude as king the entire time. So Samuel, the prophet of the Lord, one that obeyed God and loved God and walked with God all of his life, did not fear man but feared God, a reverential fear of God. Samuel took up his sword and he took King Agag's head clean off. We're we're talking about the avenger, God in the role as the avenger. You know, the enemy, the Bible tells us that he is a defeated foe. And all we have to do is speak the word of the Lord, trust in God, and allow God, the avenger, to do the rest. I want to mention to you also, Joseph. Oh my goodness, you talking about a man that was mistreated. We all remember the story, how his brothers were jealous of him. And I don't have time to go through all the horrible things that happened to him. But oh my goodness, as a result of what they did, betraying him, throwing him down in a pit, he wounds up in Egypt in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife wants to have a relationship with him and he refuses her, so she lies on him and and he wounds up in prison. You're talking about a man that had done nothing but had been given dreams and visions from the Lord, loved God, trying to serve God, and this is what the enemy does through people to him. But you know what? In the midst of all that he went through, the God of the mountain that he served and the God of the valley that he served brought Joseph through. Joseph was promoted down there in Egypt. He was second in 
in command under Pharaoh. And when the time comes that all of his brothers have to stand before him, you know the story. There had been a famine in the land. Now Joseph is over all the grain that is down in Egypt. Everybody has to come to Egypt to get grain to survive. Here come these ruthless brothers that tried to kill him. Oh my God. And Joseph recognized who they were. But to make a long story short, Joseph forgave all of them. We're still talking about the Avenger because he's also a God of mercy, a God of grace, and a God of forgiveness. And he seated them at the table with him. Again, Joseph, a type and shadow of Jesus. But yet Jesus is an Avenger. I'm going to show you a scripture at the end. You're going to go, what? And we're going to the next point on the outline. I want to mention Miriam. She was the sister of Moses. And you remember she and the baby brother Aaron began to complain about Moses. Some of the things they said concerning Moses and God was listening. And we know the story. Miriam wound up with leprosy but we're talking about the avenger and we're talking about his mercy in the midst of that Moses stood in the gap and cried out for his sister and God after several days he did heal Miriam but we learn from that people that are always this is my terminology running off at the mouth saying anything they want to say coming against especially the chosen people of God and it is an unprovoked coming against the people of God. Now, if there's something that uh, where even a chosen vessel is just sinning and doing wrong and all out of order, we are not to just stick our heads in the sand, at least recognize. We don't have to go and put our fingers in their face, but we can take it in prayer up before the Lord. God is not teaching us to be ignorant. He tells us to be wise because we're on the battlefield and we're going to have to know even who we listen to and who we follow. But here Moses, again, an avenger, type and shadow of an avenger, but yet mercy flowing through a type and shadow of Father God. But here's the part. I'm going to switch to part two. And I want to deal with what the Holy Ghost gave me coming down the road the other day, a second part to this teaching dealing with the Avenger that stopped me almost in the middle of the road. And he began to talk about that God avenges the blood of his son Jesus. That God avenges the blood of his son Jesus. I want to show you the scripture that he eventually gave me. And I tell you, you people you out there that love the Bible and love the word of God, I tell you what, this is going to cause you to pause and just say, oh my God. Because he began to talk about that precious blood where he sent a special package, his only begotten son, so that Jesus could release that holy blood upon the earth to purchase a new covenant for each one of us, to purchase our rights to be seated in Christ Jesus, to purchase speaking power and purchase authority for each one of us, all the things that the blood did to wash us from sin sin and deliver us. That holy blood. He said, I am the avenger of my son's blood. That's what he told me when I was coming down the road. And this is the scripture that was given later. Let me find that scripture. I'll show you that picture in just a moment. Hebrews 10 and verse 29. He says, of how much worse punishments, this is a new King James, how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy? Who has, listen to this, trampled the Son of God underfoot? Oh my God. Trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing. When you count the blood of Jesus, a common thing. This is what he was dealing with me concerning the blood of Jesus and God being an avenger of those that trample underfoot the blood and the really the name of Jesus. And he says, and look at that. Do you see that word? I've made it real big. Insulted 
the spirit of grace. We are living in a time when many are insulting the spirit of grace and trampling underfoot the blood of Jesus, the price that he paid. And I just want to just say pause and think about that for a moment. With our lifestyle, we are insulting the spirit of grace. And this is how it works. It's my thing, and I'll do what I want to do. And that is exactly what is going on in the body of Christ. Many reach into the word of God, and they take out the part that they want to obey, and that that they don't want to concern themselves with, they throw that away to the side. Oh my God. But God let me know, I am the avenger of my son's blood. And let me tell you something that he said about the blood. Let me get here on my note. He said, the blood validates the word of God. The word teaches in 1 Corinthians 6 and 12, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. I'm going to explain that in a moment. The Apostle Paul recorded this scripture twice in the Bible. It is also in 1 Corinthians 10 and 23. Listen to this. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. And he began to deal with how the saints of God are not taking the blood and the power of the blood and applying it to that old man and that old nature and allowing it to be crucified. Pause and think about it for a moment. Oh my God. And he said, I will avenge my son's blood. And I want to read you, let me see this note right here. I'll get to that in just a moment. Some of the things that he gave me, I'm getting my notes all scrambled up there, but some of the things that he gave me concerning the power of the blood, that we have to take that blood again and apply it to our past. Sometimes there are those that have been afflicted by oppression. They have been afflicted by abandonment. They have been afflicted by betrayal. They have been afflicted by mistreatment and they allow that to stay inside of their temples and help develop their character. Oh my God. But God said the blood was sent so that we could apply the blood. See the blood when applied it sanctifies us which means sets us apart. The blood when applied it hallows us. Be ye holy he said for I am holy. But when we don't apply the blood to that old man and that old nature this is the type of conversation we'll have. This is what will come out of our mouth. Oh well the man of stairs understand. He knows that that's, that's just how I am. And you'll sing that song year one of your walk with the Lord. Then you'll sing it in year two of your walk with the Lord. Well, he understands. I just have to, you know, just do a little cocaine, just, just a little bit here and there. I have to just drink a little wine or a little whiskey here or there. I have to go gambling just a little bit here or there. I have to have sexual liaisons even even though I'm not married, just a little bit here and there. He said, I will avenge my son's blood. Oh my God. You see where I almost stopped my vehicle in the middle of the road. I was like, oh my God. I never thought about it in that death. God is concerned and God takes note. He's watching all of our life. The Bible says his eyes go to and fro and he sees everything and he sees those who are just torn with him. There are many in the body of Christ that feel they can live as we say straight rattled the fence. Well, I'll go to church on Sunday, and I'll lift up holy hand, but Saturday night, oh my God, unspeakable thing. And they think it's all right, because they have been taught about this hyper grace, which is a deception from the enemy. The hyper grace teachers teach, oh yes, he has already forgiven us because of the power of the blood. Things that we've done in the past, things that we're doing in the future, and 
and things that we're doing now. Yes, he had. But when you use that as a license to sin, the power of the blood was given to give us overcoming power. But many are still living in unclean lifestyle, teaching their children to live unclean lifestyle. Sometimes their whole family, everybody, the mom, the dad, and the children are all smoking their marijuana in the house. Then it goes to another level. Oh, I can share a personal testimony, not about my personal house, but somebody that I know. But oh my God, not that it couldn't happen in mine. It can happen in anybody's. If we are not on guard, there is a real devil, devil and he's waiting for a point of entrance. This is why we have to guard these temples. Guard what come out of our mouth. Guard our action. That song that we have sang for years and now let the weak say, I am strong. Get in the presence of the Lord. Take to him your weaknesses and your addictions. Oh my God. And allow him to supply power and strength through the blood to cut it off and to deliver you. But when you live in a mindset he understands. He understands. He said, I will avenge my son's blood. Those who tread it underfoot. Let me just leave that scripture up there for a while. I think, yeah, this is it. And I put that word, insulted the spirit of grace. Grace is here, thank God, for God's unmerited favor. His favor and his love is upon us. But we don't insult him with our continued lifestyles of sin and just say, he understands. No, he understands that he sent his son. That his son shed his blood on the cross. And that blood is the power. That blood is the antidote to deliver us. This is why we should be on our knees in prayer. And saying, Lord God, change me. You see anything that's not glorifying to you, I ask you to remove it. But we live in a time of a greasy grace where we do what we want to do. I was reading not long ago in the Old Testament concerning Mark and St tattoos on our body. Now I know that when you're in the world, you do as the world do because you don't have a relationship with God. You don't care one way or another what God's think. That's understandable when you're getting a tattoo when you're out in darkness. But when you come into the kingdom of light and you're still going and tattooing your body up and displaying it. I was looking at some ministers just almost naked, just covering the parts that needed to be covered. Tattoos from head to toe. Some that they have gotten recently as they preach the word of God. God said, I will avenge my blood. The blood of God is holy. Glory to God. And if the blood of God has washed us and cleansed us and we are in the family of God, we have to honor even the natural blood inside of our body. But we go and when they go to those tattoo shops, you know that needle or whatever they doing the tattoos with is dealing with the blood and drawing all types of things on the temple. Know ye not that your body is the temple but all type of demonic mess in honor of other gods and yet I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. God said I will avenge the blood of my son. That blood is holy. That blood is to hallow us. Oh my God. And the reason being what is the reason? We are warriors on this battlefield and some months ago, I did a teaching on tracking hounds and trailing hounds that are used in law enforcement. Let me see, can I find my little picture of the tracking hound versus the trailing hound? They're all used to track criminals. But the tracking hound, the tracking hound finds the scent in the footprint. He can only follow that scent uh, as far as the footprint. But that trailing hound, that trailing hound, his whole servitude as a law enforcement dog is following the scent. 
He tracks the scent. And we, when we still have the scent of sin on us, when we still have the scent of betrayal, the scent of betrayal, when we have these things from our old lifestyle still connected to us, or even doors that we've opened as we've served the Lord, I want you to know the trailing hound and the tracking hounds of hell, symbolic of demonic spirits, will come and track us in an effort Effort to recapture us and bring us back under his command, back in prison, back into darkness. This is why we have to apply the power of the blood of Jesus. And some are playing with it, recognizing not that God's blood is holy. He is a holy God. The blood is holy. The blood is the blood that rescued us, the authority of the blood, ransomed us out of the devil's prison. But we insult the spirit of grace. God said again, I'm going to avenge my son's blood. Jesus shed all of his blood. And I want you to know again that he is the avenger concerning cold case files. I'm going to end with this scripture that I told you earlier I would share with you concerning Jesus himself awaiting. Listen to this. This says Jesus awaiting the completion of his own promise. Now look at this. Hebrews 10 and verse 12. It says, but this man, talking about Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Listen to this. It says, from henceforth expected. I wrote that word expected. It means it's not all over with yet. Expecting his enemies be made his footstool. So he's seated on the right hand of God. But there's going to be a part two to this thing. I told you the judgment is coming. And the enemies of the Lord, the enemies of the cross, the enemies of the blood of Jesus will be made his footstool. I want to say, Selah, pause and think about it. Are you trampling underfoot the precious blood of Jesus? Living straddled the fence, living in the world, yet saying you're serving God. We got leadership doing the same thing. Oh, my God. He will avenge his son's blood. His title again is the avenger. Father, I just thank you for the teaching of this word. Oh, Holy Ghost, may it cause a quaking and a shaking in the listener. May we begin to line up. May we not be the ones insulting the spirit of grace. May we follow, Lord God, what is written. May we stick to the word of God, that that you have given us, oh Lord God. We ask that you touch our hearts again, that you circumcise us afresh, that you forgive us, Lord God, trampling underfoot the spirit of grace. May we reverence you with the reverential fear, Lord God, and with the love, Lord God. Oh, a true love, an agape love. In the name of Jesus, we pray. This is Minister Pat Holmes signing off, and I want to end with the word I always end with, shalom, which means peace.